panelists are uh, assembling, I'll take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Laurel Green. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I live in Calgary. And I want to acknowledge that Calgary is Treaty 7 territory and the traditional home of the Blackfoot, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina, and also home to the Métis Region 3. Uh, I want to say, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we can arrange ourselves in this way without us having to be up here, um, but I did want to again draw all of your attention to the fact that Ramona here is capturing this conversation for HowlRound TV. How many folks here have heard of HowlRound or visited their website? Awesome. So this conversation will be logged and captured on HowlRound and you can revisit it uh, anytime in the future after tomorrow, I think. Um, if at any point you would like to get up and stretch your legs or want to exit the room uh, or go get something else, we're the last session before lunch, so I get it and I really want to uh, encourage you to do so. Uh, please make sure those of you on the edges uh, that folks can exit safely uh, during the panel. Um, but feel free to get up and move around. We now have this entire space to ourselves, which is really great. Um, as I said, my name is Laurel. And so I'll be moderating today's panel. I brought a few questions uh, for uh, the folks that I've asked to join me. I want to uh, acknowledge that um, I have selected a group of artists uh, whose work I was very interested in. And uh, by virtue of that, uh, they are all artists who, and I don't want to make too many assumptions, but who are living and working primarily in Canada. So that's the context that we're going to be speaking about this work in. Uh, my uh, fascination was with the role of dramaturgs and directors. Not to draw a border between those two practices, but to say how do we hop, skip, jump, trespass, go back and forth between all of those borders? How do those roles inform and infuriate each other? Uh, what is it that's fruitful about working at the intersection? Um, my work is primarily as a dramaturg, uh, especially focusing on new play development in a variety of forms. And uh, recently I have begun to work more as a director. So this is where a lot of my questions are coming from. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have the Directors Lab North folks with us here today. I really wanted to apply to Directors Lab North, but I couldn't because uh, I'm here at the LMDA conference. I'm actually the president of the LMDA Canada Board of Directors. But I just want to give a moment for Evan and Esther to just stand and maybe give us the few line synopsis of what's Directors Lab North and what have you been up to this week? Yes, yeah, so we are a sister program to the Lincoln Center Lab. We've been around for about eight years <coughs> and we've been growing bit by bit. And this year we brought together 28 directors from the UK. Uh, we partnered with the British Council to bring the UK artistic directors here with us. Uh, directors all across America and all across Canada to spend eight days with each other to discuss methodologies, pedagogy, uh, discourse, discussions, interrogate each other and our art and also we partnered with Luminato to bring them to a lot of the shows and then artists from those shows come and speak to us the next day about the creation um, of their pieces. Yeah. That's Esther, awesome. Sounds know? fantastic. <laughs> nope, that was it. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad that we could have your group uh, come and be with us. And uh, again, so that's why I say, you know, I've uh, convened the panel and, and brought in some people whose work I find very interesting and who I'm very excited to talk to. But I want to keep my talking to a minimum and also give uh, a lot of chance for you to ask questions and to really get into the um, nuts and bolts of the work uh, that we're all doing. Um, Yes, Sarah, here you are, hello. Could you come over and join us over here, just because Ramona is capturing the conversation for HowlRound. Oh. Great, hello. So uh, we'll start with you. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> but it's easy. First, first question's easy. I'd just love for you to share your name, uh, your personal pronouns, uh, and uh, whatever you'd like to share about where you're from and, and what brings you here today to the conference. Uh, my name is Sarah Garten Stanley. Um, I go by she and her, uh, but I contemplate they all the time. Um, I am. I live in Kingston, Ontario, which is across from Kingston, New York. Um, and I uh, work at the National Arts Center. I'm the associate artistic mm. director there, and the uh, co-founder and uh, creative catalyst at Spiderweb Show. Uh, yeah, it's great. Hi, uh, my name is Jenna Rogers. I use she, her pronouns. 
Um, I am currently based in Calgary or Mokinsis, uh, Treaty 7 territory, as Laurel has already introduced. Uh, I, but I was born in Edmonton, which is Treaty 6 territory, also home to the Métis and to the Cree populations. Hi, my name is Emma Tivaldo, uh, she, her. I am the Artistic Director of Playwrights Workshop Montreal, which is a national new creation development centre. Um, Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bob White. I'm uh, you know, in Stratford, live in Stratford, Ontario. I'm the director of new plays at the festival, and he, his, him, him, his. Uh, Stephen Clella. I'm from Toronto. I'm the associate artistic director and dramaturg at Young People's Theatre. Hi, my oh, name. He, him. Sorry. I did that already, never mind. <laughs> uh, my name is Marie Leofele Romero Barlizo. I am uh, from Montreal. I am a playwright and dramaturg. Um, I, my pronouns are she, uh, she and her. I'm also a playwriting mentor at Black Theatre Workshop uh, and, um, and also the production dramaturg for um, Table Do Theatre's Blackout, which is uh, coming we're going to be produced in February about the Concordia riots in 1969. Great. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, what I'm interested in discussing today uh, with all of you is um, where do the borders lie between our two practices of directing and dramaturgy? When and how do we cross them? What can a dramaturgical approach offer a directing process at every stage of the production? How do our skill sets, these two skill sets, complement and complicate, inform and infuriate each other? I would like to explore the opportunity for this dual role and just some, swap some stories and strategies. So I wonder if we could kick it off, and I'll ask this question of the panelists, but also of all of you. How many of you in the room identify as a dramaturg? And how many of you identify as a director? And how many of you identify as both? Great, so we've got some people on uh, all ends of the spectrum. Uh, I wonder, uh, Emma, I'm gonna pick up on something that you said in a panel yesterday, um, which was that you trained first as a director, graduated from National Theater School, um, and so your work as a dramaturg has actually come a little bit later on uh, in your practice, and that for you is still something that you're working on today, that's, that's occupying you to uh, continue to strive to figure out sort of what is uh, your dramaturgy and how do you enact that practice. Yep. So I wonder if you could start us off just talking about this first identification as a director mm -hmm. and then what drew you to the practice of dramaturgy? What circumstances put, put you in that role for the first time? Right, um, so uh, I came to theater really late. Uh, I was in my mid thirties. Um, I think I was, I'm one of the oldest directors to graduate from the National Theater School. Um, so, um, so before that, uh, I was a graphic designer and uh, published uh, a punk rock music magazine. Uh, so I had absolutely no idea why I was going into theater, except that I had this, this urge. I was very, um, I was kind of at a, I was really depressed. And so, um, and, and I knew I wanted to do theater. So, so I applied to theater school and I got in by some fluke. I think it was a mistake. And, um, <clears throat> And then started working actually as, as a playwright, stage manager, actor. I thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, and then landed in stage management. And somehow through the stage management uh, sector was working with Peter Hinton. And uh, that sort of got me in thinking about directing and then uh, went to the National Theater School, graduated as a, as a director, Sarah Stanley was one of my mentors, and I would like to dispel something. She said she isn't an actor, but she's an awesome actor. Um, um, <laughs> directed, uh, one of my first projects out of school was, uh, Sarah was an actor in the piece. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I was directing, and then Paula Dankert from, um, Playwrights Workshop Montreal called me in as a dramaturg, and, and I had been mentoring under Peter Hinton and, and Paula for, for a while uh, at that point. So, so I, the, the two things kind of collided, and um, once I graduated from the National Theatre School, I was working in their playwriting um, program with 
Brian Drader, who's right there, um, and got to meet all these incredible playwrights and um, um, and sort of the, the, the intersection between doing dramaturgy on new work and directing sort of became the thing that I loved and I did. So I've been working with a lot of emerging playwrights on their first productions. Um, I co-founded a theater company where I was, we were doing uh, first productions of plays and translation, which is also a kind of dramaturgy because you're dramaturging plays and translation, which obviously leads to um, questions about um, the work that you're working on, as Bob would know. Um, and, um, and so what was the question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, what led you into dramaturgy? So that's a, a uh, great well, context. I think, about yeah, that was... That was that was it. Working with playwrights and and being a director and the two things sort of came together. And and really, mentorship for me was was my way in. I didn't study dramaturgy. It was really about working with with um, other people who were doing that work. Um, and I haven't figured it out. I really haven't. It's been ten years that I've been the artistic director of Playwrights Workshop Montreal, and it's been uh, a constant struggle to figure out what 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 I do in the room and how I do it. Um, um, and it changes. Um, I feel like I'm starting to figure out um, how, how to work with people, but I, uh, for, for me, putting the artist at the center of everything is really important and uh, is, is, is what I try to do, and I try to tailor whatever process around what the artist needs or who the artist is. Um, I sometimes take myself out of the picture. Uh, many times I take myself out of the picture. Um, no, I, I don't know if that's... That's sometimes true and sometimes not true. That's Thanks, Emma. Sometimes bullshit. Yeah. Um, Bob, I want to turn to you for a moment um, and just uh, ask you about uh, how you began working first. Was it as a dramaturg or a director? And what was the moment where one or both of those roles, uh, you took on one or both of those roles? Yeah, before I get there, just a, I think the kind of distinction is a bit arbitrary. I think it's very important, from my point of view, to realize that dramaturgy is, in fact, a process, it's not a job. And the dramaturgical process happens all the time, whether there's a dramaturg in the room or not. That first audience is the best dramaturgy any, of, any playwright is going to experience. And so all you're hoping to do, I think, as a dramaturg is help channel what that might be and develop a relationship with the writer to kind of help to get there. So I think that makes it a kind of, you know, it's a bit different than a lighting designer because, you know, if, if you don't have lights for the show, in most cases, you know, you're in trouble. You don't necessarily need to have a dramaturg in, in the room, even on new plays, as far as I'm concerned. But the, how I got into it was really easy. I was a, a grad student at the University of Alberta back in 1970, and... Um, <laughs> 60 what? <laughs> 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 and... Uh, I was doing a master's degree. I was not doing an MFA. I had done a, an English uh, degree in Montreal at Loyola College. It was part of those riots in 69. Mm. Uh, and um, um, found out about this gig called being a dramaturg there. We, there. One of the professors at the <coughs> University of Alberta at the time was uh, a, a German immigrant named John Terflot. And he, of course, was versed in all of that stuff in German theater and this job, dramaturg, and I found it fascinating. And I thought, well, I wasn't trained as a director, I wasn't trained as an actor, here's somehow I can actually, rather than just becoming, not, nothing wrong with this, a teacher of drama, I could actually be an active participant in the room. Left at Edmonton in Toronto, arrived in Toronto in 1972, there I've given it away, um, <laughs> just when the, the first wave of Canadian theaters were being founded, and they needed people to read plays as simple as that. And uh, so I went into the fa uh, factory theater, factory theater lab at the time, and Ken Gass, the artistic director, after I had a copy with him, gave me a job as assistant dramaturg, there were two other dramaturgs, uh, for $15 a week to read plays. So that's where it started. And so I spent the first uh, eight, nine years of my career working as a dramaturg, both in Toronto and then in Montreal as um, dramaturg at the Playwrights Workshop Montreal. And then made the shift um, through a bunch of very strange <laughs> circumstances. I became artistic director of the Factory Theatre in 1978 um, and had always, the work that I had done with various directors as a dramaturg up to them but had been uh, unsatisfying. And I figured I could do no worse, really, as a director. 
So artistic director, I hired myself to direct plays. It was as simple as that. And thanks to the grace of a re remarkable group of actors that I worked with over those first few years, learned on the job um, the do's and don'ts of, of, of creating a room for creation and, and, and sharing that space. So that's basically how I became a director, was just kind of giving myself the job, because no one else would, so I, I could do that. And uh, that led to a, a nine year stay at the factory, then out west for 25 years at, and, uh, at ATP. And uh, so that's where the directing, sort of an outgrowth yeah. of the dramaturgical work in the sense. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I think my work as a director, because it's primarily on new plays, uh, you know, overlapped. It was sort of more or less doing the same thing, except, I guess, wearing two different hats. Mm -hmm. I don't, but I don't really know if they were two different hats. It's just me. Well, I really appreciate you bringing up the idea of the fluidity between those two roles and the, you know, arbitrariness with which you could try to draw a line between them, but when especially you're working on a new play, those things... I mean, I found um, it very helpful ever since I left ATP and I took this gig at uh, Stratford, where I'm not a director, I'm a dramaturg in the room. Very helpful to be the dramaturg in the room having been a director and knowing, okay, I know where my <laughs> the rules are and, you know, how to, to negotiate that collaboration in a way that I think might be different if I didn't have that directing experience. One of my questions, and I, um, I was I'm very interested to throw to Jenna, um, because you work a lot uh, with playwrights on different stages of development of work, and occasionally will direct that work as well. Um, does your relationship with a playwright change when you become the director of the piece rather than the dramaturg, or have you ever noticed um, any moment um, where that relationship seems to take on a new life, or there was just a different way of, re of relating? Good question. I, I actually don't, I'm trying to think, I'm like, I don't know that I've ever been asked to see a project all the way through that wasn't my own. So I don't know that I've ever actively like had to switch or navigate that relationship other than like to do a staged reading, mm -hmm. which usually <laughs> for me is with music stands. So um, I can say that I, I do feel like the jobs are really different, like I feel like they engage different parts of my brain. Um, that is the dramaturg, I, I first and foremost feel very accountable to my relationship with the writer and um, it's the, <laughs> it is the writer first, mm -hmm. it's about their needs and, and facilitating that process and, and as a director I, I know that my relationship is with my cast and it's not that I don't have a relationship with the, the writer, but that my that I am paying attention to a, a cast and the questions I have about the script stop becoming, honestly, they, I mean, they don't, but they, I find them to stop when I'm directing. I'm like, I don't have any really meaningful questions. All my questions are about how can I, how can I make this thing happen on stage? And so I know that there's a different part because I've observed that in the room when I'm dramaturging that, that directors aren't necessarily asking super deep questions. They're trying to find ways to negotiate a, something they need to achieve on stage. And so I can feel that shift, but I don't know that I've necessarily negotiated it from start to finish with a single playwright. Stephen, I just want to throw to you because there's a recent project that you worked on. I'm really curious to hear more about. I unfortunately didn't get to see the production, but what the, uh, but the play was selfie by Christine uh, Quintana. And um, the uh, interesting fable of the play coming to fruition was that it came out of a submissions process that Stephen manages at theater uh, at uh, at his theater company, and then you became the director of the play and moved forward with the production. So mm -hmm. I would love to hear more about that moment of deciding to direct the play. What attracted you to the material and wanting to work with Christine and bringing it forward onto the stage? Sure. Um, to be clear, uh, it did actually have some development at another company at Teatzism in Vancouver, who had commissioned it uh, and had a shorter version. So what she sent me did have a bit of support before coming in um, through the unsolicited process. Um, and this is the only time in over the 10 years I've been there, we have actually produced something that came through um, our unsolicited, as I'd like to say, we have a better track record, but uh, it is what it is. So um, I was instantly interested in the, the voice that she had, the subject matter, which is dealing with primarily consent um, and the angle at which she approached it. Um, she happened to be in Toronto at the time. I just sent her a message and said, I'd love to talk to you about this. And 
we sat down and had coffee, and I don't think going into it I went, oh, this is a play I'm going to direct. Um, I just knew that it was something that I thought had value to our theater and something that would um, engender both a good piece of theater and really good conversations with our audience. Um, so we just started along um, a process of you know writing a few more drafts, expanding what she had um, based on what we, in our conversations, agreed were um, shared places the play could go. Um, and up until that point, uh, I, I trained as a dramaturg. Um, I, in undergrad, I had done some directing, but I think I made a point when I learned about dramaturgy in a similar way um, to Bob, because I had actually been an English major, not a theater major. And I went, oh, this is actually a way to kind of marry these, these two interests that I've got. So I went and I um, went to the University of Glasgow and I got my dramaturgy degree, and then I moved to Toronto, because I had been from the States originally. Um, and there were a lot of people at least a handful who said to me, oh, so are you a dramaturg because you want to direct but you can't? Mm -hmm. And I went, no, no, I actually want to be a dramaturg. So I think I put up this wall where I went, I'm just never going to direct. I don't want people to think I'm a failed director who landed in this field. Um, and then after a few years, I realized that was really stupid of me to do, that I was just letting other people define what I thought I should be doing. So I sort of opened myself up to the idea that maybe, maybe I would... Um, direct at some point. And there were a few projects that had come along um, through YPT where I was going, maybe I will, but I realized that there were better choices. So I always sort of deferred to what I thought were the better matches to the project um, in working with the artistic director and building those artistic teams. Um, but then there was just something with selfie, um, perhaps it was a style of the writing that I just instantly engaged with that I sort of went, you know, I, I kind of, I don't want to let go because I feel like sometimes when I'm working as a dramaturg, there comes a point where it's not a handover, but you sort of go, I'm, I'm not the person who needs to speak up the most, I'm kind of the person who should speak the least. Uh, and I sort of went, I want to keep talking. I want to keep in, engaging in this conversation. Um, and luckily the playwright was interested in me doing that. So uh, I think after about a year and a half of development, we decided that I was going to do both roles and went from there. Was this your first play as a director? It was my first play as a director, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it was, it was interesting for me because I got, it, I felt like being the dramaturg on it was really useful because there was so much that I was already immersed in when I came into this that I felt like I had uh, a breadth of knowledge about what was happening in the play. Um, and it just sort of fed me in a way that I would want a director that wasn't me who had taken over to have learned all these things. So that was great. But I think late in the process when I started to go, hmm, is this part of the play working inside my brain? I was fighting back and forth about whether that was the director being lazy or the dramaturg having a good point. Um, and I <laughs> left it to the playwright to decide which of those voices was speaking. It was the lazy director. Um, funny which that. was fine, yeah, funny that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I, I, I really enjoyed having that new perspective on being able to take the work further and then I'm doing it again next year as well, though I'm co-directing that one, um, just because of the nature of how it's developed. And what was the reception like to the piece, and, and what did you learn about uh, yourself as a director? Um, the reception was really positive. It created a lot of conversation. Um, not to go too deep into the play, but um, it is about uh, an act of sexual violence that happens. Um, but where this was different was the uh, the male perpetrator was actually very likable. Everybody was on his side, and it was in a very gray area emotionally for a lot of people, because there was a strong attraction between the two characters. Um, there was a real strong feeling that he thought that this was the right thing, uh, and it took some time for her to figure out what had happened to her. Uh, so I think for a lot of the young people, and for a lot of adults, there was questions of, uh, was that consent or was that not? It, it wasn't consent, um, but the response was very visceral, and I think there's a lot of visceral, and a lot of people who want to have that conversation. Um, so it was received really well, and I guess, um, what did I learn about myself? Um, I guess I hit a point where I, I feel like as a drama, like I, I think I brought a lot of dramaturgical sensibility towards the construction of the piece in terms of how my collaborative nature as a dramaturg informed the relationship I had with designers and director, or the uh, designers and the actors. 
I, but I think when I got to the end, I also reached a point of this is what I have done and I am happy with it. And not that it's unassailable because I'm happy to talk about it more, but I'm not going to either apologize or feel too proud about it. I feel like I've reached a place where I'm quite content and it is what it is and just learning to accept that. Whereas I think sometimes dramaturgically I'm always looking to keep working and mm -hmm. maybe there's like in the next iteration of the plan, I've sort of gone, no, this is the thing and it feels like it has an end to it for me. Right. Yeah. Thank you. A really uh, exciting way to think about your directing being informed by those dramaturgical impulses or underpinnings to you and how they can work together. I just want to draw an interesting counterpoint to Sarah, uh, your uh, play Out the Window uh, that is at Luminato right now and that I got the uh, chance to see last night. Um, and just uh, picking up on this thread of Stephen talking about following something from start to finish, uh, you had an opposite role as the director because you joined the piece was it almost 10 years in the making or was it because uh, it was quite a while um, there were a few other iterations of the piece um, and so while I was watching the show at Luminato I was thinking a lot about what you had brought to it and having seen some of your other work noticing some of the th common threads and and really feeling like how they were gelling with uh, the story that the playwright had created. So I wonder if you could talk a, uh, to us a bit about what it was like to come in on the piece and bring your, yourself to it. Yeah, uh, well, really nerve wracking to, to begin with because um, the events that the, that the piece chronicles happened 18 years ago. Uh, and Liza Balkan, the writer and the subject uh, of the story, um, was and continues to be the, the the locus, the heart, the center, and the indeed the 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 person who did all the work to both be a citizen and uh, take action on something that she saw, and then do all the work of getting all of the uh, various transcripts, meeting all the various people, and uh, with a number of different collaborators over a period of years, um, beginning to shape uh, a piece of theatrical storytelling. Um, in fact, Trevor Schwellness, the designer, was the first uh, other to work with Liza at the very beginning at a piece at uh, Buddies in Bad Times at the Rhubarb Festival that I think was like 15 minutes long in 2008 or maybe six, like, a like quite a long time ago. And then Chris Abraham came on board with the project um, and worked with it a little bit with the second year students at the National Theatre School. and. Brett uh, Donahue, who's one of the actors, is still in the show. So he was in his second year at theater school in uh, like I think 2009, maybe. Um, so he brings that history. And then uh, the Theater Center, um, with, through Franco Bonnie uh, in particular, has been a huge champion of the work and of Liza's work. And uh, he brought uh, Chris Abraham as director and that piece into residency at the Theater Center. And Ashlyn Rose, who was part of it at that time, she was also working at uh, Crows with Chris Abraham. Now Ashlyn is the uh, creative producer at the Theatre Centre and lead producer on this version of Out the Window. And Naomi Campbell, who's the deputy artistic director at Luminato, um, lived in the building that Liza was staying in when she witnessed this event and goes back very centrally to the beginning of that story. And she's been the lead sort of uh, producer voice from uh, Luminato. So all to say that I came on board as a as a, a director very late in the game. Um, the last production of it happened in 2012 uh, at the Theatre Centre and uh, when Luminato approached Theatre Centre about doing a Toronto-based story, um, essentially, uh, this was the one that Franco wanted to do. And, uh, and so I was asked to direct it and, um, and probably anybody here can imagine the kinds of stress that might cause given all of the various people who had been involved with it previously. Um, but I was also charged with the uh, question of what does it mean now? Because this story is about um, uh, Otto Voss, who was a 53-year-old Hungarian man suffering from mental uh, illness, um, acknowledged, uh, acknowledged to be, um, who was brutally um, uh, beaten to death by, by the cops. Um, since that time, it's become very, very clear that um, uh, people who identify as mad or don't identify as mad and are seen to be mad um, by the police, and, and more particularly, uh, black bodies and indigenous bodies are, are, for lack of a better word, targeted by the, in the complex of policing in this, in this country, in Canada, we'll say, and in Toronto in particular. And so it felt uh, to Franco and, uh, and to all of us that it would be irresponsible to not acknowledge uh, in some theatrical question or way the reality uh, 
the, the core realities of the intersection between madness, um, black and indigenous bodies in particular. Um, and so a story that was a very single focus perspective uh, of Liza Balkans needed to find an expansion. And, um, and the way in which we did it, which I'm, uh, I really love, is uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Cyrus Marcus Ware on some other projects. Uh, he is a, a black trans artist who has an incredible practice, most particularly um, uh, working on activist portraits that he works in massive scale to, uh, s to simply aggrandize the work of activists um, uh, across uh, sort of North America, but from a particular perspective of Black Lives Matter Toronto, which is uh, one of the, where he's a core member. Um, and to work with him on asking the question about how we can look at the people um, and some of the people, the many people who have been uh, taken down by the cops and this particular problem. Uh, so working with him and then with Lal, who are an incredible uh, local activist um, uh, band who I just love and, um, and who I had worked with previously along with Cyrus on some of the uh, work that we were, were doing with the intersection of, of um, disability uh, storytelling, basically, and how that uh, impacts um, uh, major forces in storytelling. So I guess what I could say is uh, uh, coming to it that late uh, allowed me the history of many different attempts and many different drafts and many different iterations and, um, and offered me a, an acute challenge to fulfill the wishes and desires of a bunch of different people in terms of bringing a, a story and a multitude of perspectives uh, to, to a stage. Um, so I, uh, having, having opened it, I, I really can't think of a more engaged personal moment as a director slash dramaturgical thinker that I've had in, in, in many, many moons, so yeah. yeah. Uh, Jenna, I just want to duck over to you a bit to pick up on this notion of reinterpreting something and making it your own. Um, you've got a production coming up at Summerworks of Winners and Losers, a new adaptation uh, of a play. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the genesis of that project and, and how you came to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so many of you in Canada and perhaps even in the United States might know Winners and Losers. It's written by um, Marcus Youssef and James Long, Jamie long uh, out in Vancouver. It's toured a lot. Um, <laughs> the, the premise of it is, is kind of two guys fighting, like arguing. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they play a game called Winners and Losers in which they argue about whether a person, place, or thing is a winner or a loser. Um, and through this exploration of their own opinions, it start to reveal their their um, maybe deep-held or deep-seated personal truths, uh, which ultimately are revealed to be somewhat in conflict with one another. Um, and what toll does that take on a friendship? It was a it was a personal play, largely based on their own lives and experiences for them. Um, and I thought that it would be really cool <laughs> to adapt the play uh, with women. Um, and so, yeah, I think. <laughs> that that was the I idea was to to do it with women and I I um, got a couple of friends together who were interested in working on it. I, I run a small company in Calgary called Chromatic Theatre that does uh, work by and for people of color uh, and I got a couple of friends together to start work on the process to play the game to basically argue with one another <laughs> in a room and see what it felt like see what it worked what worked, and it really quickly demonstrated to us that women fight very differently from men. Um, um, there's this whole like hotel bell you're supposed to ding when you make a point, and no one wanted to touch this bell, and we had to take a lot of breaks and um, <laughs> talk about our feelings. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, and and ultimately, I wrote about this for Canadian Times on the Spider Web show. Uh, ultimately, the perform one of the performers that I asked to work on it, it didn't it didn't um, stick. I invited another performer in who, and we're moving forward with her. So I'm working with two artists, um, uh, Valerie Planche and Makambe K. Samamba, in the production we're bringing to uh, Toronto, which will mount again in Calgary in the fall. 
And um, uh, the process that we entered was sort of, <laughs> to me, it was a dramaturgically driven process, really. We took the original text, once we decided we were going to do this, we took the text and we broke it down into a dramaturgical skeleton, which was a series of putting post-its on the wall, like a massive wall, that really tried to outline um, the bones of the play. So not, not the scenes or the content at all, but the navigation through beginning, middle, and end, like rising action, falling action. But it was actually a lot trickier. There were a lot of functions and how to pull the rug out from someone and um, upset someone or um, take a break. Uh, um, and then we, did, we took a month off and came back for a week and we improvised a lot and then sent away nearly 10 hours of material to be transcribed and then went away for a week, uh, a while, came back with, with a massive pile of text and started going through it and putting, um, using that as the meat and hanging that on the skeleton. Uh, and so what we have, and I'd say it's about 85% of the way done, we have three weeks to hash it out in, in rehearsal studio before bringing it to summer works. Um, what we have is now a play that is, I would say, almost the exact same structure as the original, but with entirely different content. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with that. Yeah. And just that, I'm fascinated by how that process came to be and, you know, just um, really driven by that central question of how would women fight and how would women play this game? Yes. And it is, it is an examination of female friendships and, and there's a, it, it's funny because I don't feel at all like a director in a room. Sometimes they have to be like, Jenna, make a choice. You tell us. And I'm like, oh, oh, because I'm too interested in the questions and the expansiveness of it. And so I really think that this three weeks in, in, in July, August is going to speak to your original question about <laughs> navigating the difference because I have to put on, I'm going to have to put on a director hat mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh, Marie, I want to uh, uh, talk to you a bit about how your career is, is continuing to evolve. Um, as a dramaturg and taking on some uh, different kinds of directing projects. You were telling me about being part of a process, uh, a part of a project story where a player was performing, um, an actor was performing in a bar each week and different directors were working with that performer uh, for each chapter of the performance and you were one of those directors. What was that like coming into that sort of larger process but just uh, with this specific view of the, the chapter you were responsible for? Well, first I just want to give you a little context about where I, I, I come from. Mm -hmm. um, I came into um, theater very late. Uh, I think it's very late, so I wrote my first play. I, I mean, first I identify as a playwright. First and foremost, I am a playwright, and when I work with playwrights on, on, on their work, I'm a playwright's dramaturg, as opposed to a dramaturg. And I mostly work with new plays, um, and I only work as a director because I'm forced to work as a director. And I work mostly because no one else will produce my work. And so I've just taken initiative and empower myself. And also I've lost a lot of my, my plays because of that, because I feel like the meaning of where my work is uh, loses it. For, uh, I lose the meaning of the work, where the story is going. So I feel that I've empowered myself as a, a playwright and dramaturg and also as a director directing my the first uh, workshop production of my plays. Um, and so what's happening now in Montreal, um, there's, a, there's a big shift in Montreal that's happening because there's so many uh, incredible programs that are uh, working with um, diverse or people of color to develop them because there's a, a need for, for that. And, that, and that's Playwrights Workshop Montreal's uh, Young Creators Unit, there's Black Theatre Workshop, Artist Mentorship Program, and also Imago's Artista. And, um, and I'm also, my mandate is to develop new plays by people of color and also um, give, to make sure that there's more work out there for people of color. Um, so I was asked to, um, Lynn Kozak is a, she's not actually a, a theater um, creator, but she is a, a McGill professor who uh, who, uh, who teaches classics at McGill and who got a huge grant, a six-figure grant, to work on the translation of the Iliad. And I've worked mostly on new plays. I have worked, um, uh, so that was really exciting to me, but I didn't really understand what the process was um, until I really got into the process. And 
my philosophy right now is to actually take risks, to shake up my practice. But I didn't know uh, what I was really getting into. My, uh, getting into. And so Lynn was um, translating the piece, each of the chapters, like 600 lines of each of the chapters of the Iliad each week from January until August. And she's hired um, a director, and the director doesn't have to identify as a director because it could be like a, an actor directing the, the process. Uh, and for me, it was exciting because there's actually, she's working from the Greek, and I'm working from different translations uh, of the piece. And so she's translating um, the piece as we go. Um, so there, like for the week, basically we go, we went into um, uh, table work on the Tuesday. After she's performed the night before, we go into table work with a new director on the Tuesday, and you have 20 hours rehearsal. Um, and she basically, every day, she's coming in with a new draft that she's memorized. And so I'm there <laughs> trying to catch up because I'm very text-based. And, and so I had, the first day I had a recorder and I would go home and I would just like start uh, basically tr uh, transcribing whatever and it, that wasn't working for me uh, because it was just too much. And so getting into rehearsal with her the next day, I just brought myself and listened to her needs as a, as what she needed to do uh, for the piece. And so that to me was really exciting. It, it also made me trust myself more as a theater artist. I really uh, appreciate the, um, what I'm hearing from each of you about sort of the moment that something about a piece resonated with you, you wanted to bring something of your own practice or something of yourself to it. And that was sort of what led you to take on the project, you know, as risky or, or difficult or as, um, you know, full as it, as it may have been. Um, and so I want to ask Emma about a recent project uh, that I saw her, a play that she directed, that I saw in Calgary called uh, Miss Caitlin's Grade Threes Prepare for the Inevitable by <laughs> Elena Bellier. Uh, and um, again, Emma, I, knowing just a little bit about the history of the piece, I know there was um, another production mm -hmm. uh, performed uh, before you came along to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, what, but I just want to open the door to the question. What was it that attracted you to want to work on that project? What about yourself did you see in it? And what um, about your relationship with the playwright led you to take it on? Uh, so, uh, Elena is a queer artist from um, Edmonton, and she is a um, gatherer of human beings and stories and uh, a force to be reckoned with. She's just an amazing human being. I met her at the National Theater School. I dramaturged her, her final piece. and. Um, uh, I, I love her. I love her, her spirit, her words, her, her outlook, her activism, her, her need to change the world. And so, um, Miss Caitlin had been uh, dramaturged by Iris Turcott, uh, and they'd had a session just before Iris passed. And um, before that, uh, the play had been produced by um, a director in Montreal very successfully. Uh, it had gone across the country uh, in French festival and was very, very popular. Um, I, however, uh, will say that I, uh, that I felt there was something more to the piece. There's a, there was something more to be mine. There was um, a part of her that I didn't quite see in the piece yet, uh, a part of her um, need, need to embody this character and to uh, embody the journey of this woman and this idea of fear and what fear can do to the psyche. And, how it can destroy a human being and, and what it can do to uh, a classroom. So the piece, she uh, actually sets up the room where everyone in the audience is a participant, everyone is uh, a grade three um, students, a student, and she interacts with them. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, you know, she, she had, we work really well together. She had wondered if I could be the person who can take the piece somewhere else dramaturgically and, and directorially. So we worked for a really long time, sort of mining the text. So a lot of the rehearsal process was about what is this, this who is this character, and how do we uh, fully embody her, and how does she um, bring the audience along on, on this journey, and how can we do it so that the audience doesn't disconnect and look at and, and see her as someone who has already 
uh, lost her way uh, from the beginning of the play. And so how do we carry the audience so that they can actually understand every one of her decisions uh, to get to the, the final sort of tragic moment in the play? No one dies, but uh, I think someone should. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I always think someone should die in a play. Um, I mean that, uh, not, not at all. Uh, but uh, um, so, so that's what attracted us uh, to each other and, and to the piece. And so we just watched this, this, this woman who, who is a really caring human being uh, get caught up in this fear when it comes to um, guns and uh, the idea of guns in the classroom. And just as the play was going on, of course, there were two shootings, um, mass shootings in the United States <coughs> at the same time. So again, this, 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 this looking at ourselves, it can't happen in Canada. Of course it can happen in Canada. And coming from Montreal, where there have been three mass shootings in schools, it's very real. And uh, so this idea of fear and um, um, hysteria and how, how do we how do we reconnect um, to our humanity and figure out a way through this um, was a big part of that journey dramaturgically and then directorially. So, you know, we worked dramaturgically right to opening night. So, um, so yeah, the lines were really blurred. And 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 I, I do think that directorially it suffered a little because I didn't have time to really think about design as mm -hmm. fully as I wanted to or needed to. Um, uh, but I really loved what she did, and I really loved the way she told the story, and I was really satisfied by her connection with the audience. And, and yeah, I haven't talked to her since, so I don't know how she feels, but, I, <laughs> but we will. We're meeting in a week. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I wonder if anything that someone has said so far is resonating with you, uh, or if there was a comment you wanted to make. Yes? Yeah, Emma, I, um, oh, I feel that so much director and creator and I work a lot uh, yeah making new pieces with you know a lot of times um, uh, actors who are also writing so former creators and uh, they, they want to bring me on hey can you direct this and then they like come in with this like script that's just like like just unformed you know um, that's that's all the like kernels and the ideas are there that like it needs to get like figured out Okay, and so then I, I feel like I spend all the time like helping figuring out the dramaturgy, and then like, oh my god, we have like three rehearsals left, and now we have to stage and thing. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys have any, um, yeah, uh, anything to say about that? Things, maybe, I don't know, rules or uh, <laughs> techniques you have, or guidelines, <laughs> like, okay, uh, when is it time to be okay with the script and like, be the director and just take that. You got to do what you got to do. I don't know. <laughs> well, I want to highlight something that inspired this conversation for me was a conversation I had with Sarah uh, in the fall uh, before I was about to direct a, a, lar a large production. Uh, and uh, I asked Sarah, we were just, I was talking to you about what maybe some of the differences were in these jobs or, you know, when as a director do you step forward and make a choice? And Sarah said something, and I'll, I'll oddly um, paraphrase for you. Uh, if a dramaturg's job is to imagine all the doors a play could go through, it's the director's job to pick one and lead the production through it. And I found that analogy quite helpful. <laughs> because it not only gave me permission to imagine all the doors, but then to say, it's okay that now we're choosing this one. And it doesn't mean that imagining all those other doors was a waste of time or it didn't add up to anything or it wasn't useful. It actually, but it means that now we all, you know, we're going to go through this one. And that's the choice and that's where we're going. And you make that decision with your team and uh, in dialogue with others in the room and then you can lead people through together. But I just wanted to offer that and, and wonder again if that um, anyone else uh, in the room wants to comment in more along that vein. Yeah. Physicalize the dramaturgy, like, like I don't, I don't know. Like it's, it was interesting to hear that. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> That's not how I make work at all. To me, it's like, as you're investigating all the ideas, you're investigating them in space mm -hmm. with bodies. Mm -hmm. So the work is made already. By the time you make your decisions, the show is pretty much already. Yeah, stayed. like it's made. Yeah, I think that happens for sure. Yeah. 
sure. I, and it might be my just like, um, that might be like my panic voice being like, because yeah, I mean, I work the same way too. Um, you're always working on your feet and finding it on your feet. Um, but uh, yeah, just that feeling of um, could it have, like, could I have done it, could I have done a better job as a director if I hadn't focused so much on on um, helping to create the text, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I think for from an institutional perspective, one of the things that we try and do is get the director involved early in the development process. Mm -hmm. So not identify after we think the script is ready to go, okay, you're now the director, but having time for the director to be there far in advance. Mm -hmm. Because when we haven't done that, we find, okay, the director's dramaturgical voice is now coming out as we start rehearsal. And we're juggling more than we should and not giving enough time to rehearse because in Canada we just don't have enough time to rehearse as it is. So if you try and make that a workshop process as well, you're going to end up shortchanging one or the other. So if you can plan out in advance, get them involved early so they have the chance to get that voice in the room, I think by the time you then get to rehearsal, if you're lucky and you've got the resources and time to make it happen, sure you're going to discover new things and there's going to be putting it on his feet that you learn about that you have to make changes but the more you can have in advance of really getting it to the point where you're choosing the one door and going through it then i think the the better chance you're going to have at succeeding i, I don't know if this is a culturally specific thing in the uk but um there it feels uh that the role of the dramaturg uh, over the last certainly when I've been working so six, seven years, um, is actually a bit of a backlash against the role of director from the maker's point of view in terms of saying, hey, you know, I, I'm a maker, I, I don't want to work with a director who tells me what to do. Uh, usually the demographic of who that person is has been a problem in terms of traditional hierarchies, but I am interested in my work being interrogated and I am interested in that voice in the room who provokes me around form and provokes me around content and et cetera, et cetera. And there's been a bit of a shift, uh, I would say, around like how that role is honoured. For example, there's a woman, Kirsty Housley, who directed Dramatality Encounter, who's sort of invisible, really, in this very successful show, even though she was utterly integral to its, its making. And she very much fought for her, her right as a dramaturg to be in the forefront of, of uh, essentially, yeah, in the press being said what her, what her role was. Um, and she's now got an agent as a dramaturg. Oh. And within Britain, like having an agent as a dramaturg is a bit of a funny one. People are like, oh, really? Ah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> there does tend to be like a, a sort of shift around, first of all, like, what kind of makes being, what kind of work is being made, and how, and how hierarchies and uh, you know, having a kind of um, an ecosystem that is uh, varied and diverse and where the dramaturg sits within that and can facilitate that. And uh, I don't know if that conversation is going on in Canada or... Uh, Brian, well, Brian Court, who's not here right now, but he gave a keynote address a, a, a while ago where he talked about how this was the, if last century was the century of the director, this is the century of the dramaturg. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you can get it on the uh, Night Swimming uh, website. It's a really, really good uh, talk, and I, I found it personally uh, really, um, it really provoked me, and uh, yeah, it was probably t 10 years ago, or over 10 years ago now. Um, but, but I don't think, we definitely don't have that situation yet where there's a, a preeminence, but uh, um, uh, Deborah Pearson, who you know, started uh, Forest Fringe, she's Canadian, and so um, she, she, certainly a lot of the ways in which she works, I would say situ she situates in a very similar way. Um, so I, I do think I do think that as work becomes less uh, institutionally recognizable in terms of how it rolls out, uh, the dramaturg the the, the, the the position I wouldn't say power but the position the dramaturg would hold in the in the room I think will become much more um, yeah. So Debbie's my dramaturg. So <laughs> but she, she actually had to say to me, and I am a director, so she was like, directors are stupid. You know, there, there was like this really kind of like, <laughs> like idea that like, why not, that, you know, everyone should have that equal um, ownership of the work and, and in, intellectual rigorousness in terms of what they're doing. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, it, it's interesting, a different way of approaching.
approaching what we'll do as officers. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would just like to clarify something. Um, working dramaturgically uh, with that script, I meant more in terms of the actual uh, dramaturgy of putting the story on the stage. Um, uh? Production dramaturgy. Yeah, well, <coughs> no, it was like, it, it's sort of like being a director but using my dramaturgical skills in order to reveal the story. So because the story was pretty much already written, there were changes obviously along the way that really went towards what the character needed to say and how the character needed to say it on stage. It wasn't about, oh, let's do rewrites and cut this up and move it around. It wasn't about any of that. It was really about like a really deep investigation of who that character is. So just, just, just to clarify that. And in terms of my offhand saying the, the design um, suffered, it wasn't that the designer and I didn't have discussions and that it wasn't fully realized. It's just that I didn't use it fully enough and um, and and that was a lack of time and not because we didn't give the process enough time it's just I didn't give my 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 brain enough space to to take what was offered fully um, I think just to clarify yeah. that a little bit I think it strikes me that as a dramaturg words are insufficient yeah. Yeah. so yeah. often words are insufficient and, and and you bring up a good point like it's hard for me to separate my identities as director, dramaturg, dramaturg, director, and decide which one goes first because it's all part of my practice and, and like the rigor that we establish over years. And I don't know that, I mean, some days it does feel like I'm taking off one hat and putting on another, but most of the time it, it doesn't. It's just how you navigate and see, see the world. And words, words don't always do a process justice. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Which I'm is why I never um, one of the questions that we're asking is where do our borders lie? And the territory seems to be within a play and a script right now. And I'm curious, um, as <coughs> dramaturgs and directors, how one might be working without or in different modalities so that where it isn't perhaps the script and the playwright that you are working with and, and from, but other forms objects, um, uh, people, um, designer-driven work as well. And, and what are our tools and what are our verbs and what are our toolkits? And do they differentiate between um, the dramaturg and director in, in those spaces? And I just want to throw that out to the room. I just say one thing. Uh, Kim, Kim Pertel is a lighting designer. And she's one of the best dramaturgs. Yeah. Like she, uh, Bob's worked with her a lot. She, she's just, you said design, and so it just makes, like, it's, it's incredible what her eye and presence brings to clear, bringing a story forward. Um, I know that wasn't the question you're asking, but I think designers are incredible dramaturgs, or can be. Well, they often have such an incredible perspective and have <coughs> seen so much work and been in so many rooms mm -hmm. and watch it from a very particular place that I think, like, it is very true that they can be um, so keen, uh, like, so cunning in terms of how they can really get to the heart of something. And, and the other thing I'll say about the blob that you're, that you're provided with or, or uh, is that um, one of the things, I uh, can't remember, uh, what's the woman who wrote Year of Magical Thinking? Anyway. Joan Didion. Joan Didion. I think about that a lot in that the, the director, um, I'm not sure who, who has to re refuse magical thinking more. Is it the director or the dramaturg? But the, the blob is what it is. And, um, and how, how, do you work with, how do you work with that rather than thinking that I'll get in there and the blob will transform into this something that it's, that it's not. Um, and I think for me that's my constant and never learned lesson. Yeah. Mm. Like never, I, I can never recognize that lesson. But I think it's... It's like, it, it, it is, and it, it may be a beautiful blob. If you can love that blob, then that's going to be the most gorgeous blob, but it still will be that blob, not the whatever you know, st structure or story that you think it, you wished it were, yeah. Uh, I apologize for repeating. She's directing her own plays in one, in one else's 
wants to do. Um, I, I am a playwright and the director, and I really, really dislike directing my own plays because I cannot fight with myself. <laughs> and it's very frustrating. So, yeah, and like the, you know, the productive, creative fights. And there is no one minus the, of course, the actors are there, but I would, in short, I was wondering if uh, on the website or uh, on uh, HowlRound or on the LMDA website, if there could be like a blog or hub or something like playwrights and directors searching each other for each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that if we can swap work, I mean, I could direct someone's play and that person can direct my play, I would be, I'm from Romania, mm. and Romanians have a website, directors looking for plays. Mm. But I would, yeah. But I would like to push it further, because he, that's all, that's basically that's what I meant. That I would very much want to have a place, a network, where we can post a summary of what we are doing, and offer to take work. I don't know if anyone else would mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I, was I really like mm -hmm. the dynamic of working you know, with someone else on my screen, on a screen. Um, I'm just going to say one thing about that. Um, uh, when I said no one wants to direct my work, uh, I think it's, it's just in terms of like the professional production. Uh, people, I, I just had my, one of my plays produced, uh, I produced it, but Sophie G directed it at the Montreal Fringe Festival. Um, so the thing is, I am also, uh, as a, because of my, my experience with, uh, uh, with my work, I feel that I also am extremely protective over my work. So I don't send my work out. I, I have had uh, directors work with me. I mean. Emma has directed one of my first works when I came out of the National Theatre School. Um, and so just so you know that there is, uh, it's just that I'm also overprotective over my work. Yeah, please don't take offense. <laughs> <laughs> I came from, a, and I didn't, for sure, I didn't think that you're, I was thinking about, you know, all the systems in Canada, how hard it is to reach out. And I, I come from a different position. I am not overprotective of, of my work as a playwright. I'm as a director, but that's just a question. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting idea. Um, this, I know this is not the money you want to talk. It's kind of a business question. Cool. Um, how much, as a business uh, of dramaturgy, how much uh, free advice do you end up giving, and how do you navigate that? Because um, I've done it as a director dramaturgically, just with people that I know that are playwrights and I offer lovely advice and then the director is someone else. So <laughs> I'm curious about that and also for my education when it comes to the dramaturgs that I know as well. Like, ask me about plays and the development of it. Uh, I work um, as a freelance, uh, freelance dramaturg in Montreal and I also um, I'm a playwright mentor at the Main. Uh, the, um, so it's an intercultural center. Um, and so people because there's a, there's a great shift that's happening with the, and it's very exciting to see a lot of the playwrights of color uh, trying to take ownership of their work and they, they want to find somebody of color to work with. And um, what I've started to do is actually because it takes so much time and energy to read plays. Um, and so what I've started to do is actually, um, I do give some free advice, but at the same time, I, I direct them to the, the mentorship programs either at BTW or at the um, May so that I can work with them and so they also have an ownership of their work so it's not just it's, there's like a structure there and um, and I also follow the LMDA guidelines when I do contracts um, and that that's helped me as well because you know time is it's very valuable and you can't always work for free LMDA on their website, and I direct a lot of folks that ask me about things like dramaturgy fees, or if I'm employing a dramaturg, how much should I pay them? If I'm working as a dramaturg, what should I get paid? For a number of different kinds of work, um, 
the LMDA has developed a, a template and some guidelines, and they even have some sample contracts, and that's available on the LMDA website. So that is a resource that I like to share a lot with folks that are curious about how to um, contract themselves or someone else uh, in that capacity. For me, I'm pretty reticent to give feedback unless I have a relationship that I know is going to extend with the work. Um, because if I'm not getting it and I'm not invested in it long term, it actually shouldn't be my questions or my opinion that you're listening to. Find somebody who really engages with it and really wants to make it happen, and that's the person you should be having that conversation with. And if I'm not there, don't listen to me. Yeah. I think part of my work is with the Playwrights Lab program at the BAM Center, um, and, and part of that process uh, with Brian Court is like bringing writers from across the country uh, out, and they're allowed, uh, they're invited to bring a collaborator uh, to Banff with them. And, and in the past, that collaborator was a dramaturg, and, and in the present, it can be a dramaturg, but some people choose to bring other, other folks with them. So we often find ourselves in situations where we're being asked to uh, talk about a play um, uh, with someone where our relationship might not extend, uh, mm -hmm. which has been a, a definitely it's a topic that I, I talk with. I'm in constant conversation with Brian about how to negotiate that because the relationship is so important. Um, I also want to recognize that's a job, like that's a job where I'm also paid to be there and paid to be dramaturgical support <laughs> yeah. and paid to be, so like if someone wants to talk to me, I will sit down with them absolutely and give them time and ears and a lot of the time I try to concentrate my work on reflecting back to them things that they're already saying um, or picking up on patterns in their work. Um, but yeah, like I, I, otherwise I try to think of it, um, also I work in marginalized groups so when I have to charge a fee, uh, recognizing the groups that I work with, I, I often don't charge much, but also recognizing the groups I work with, if someone who has the capacity to pay me uh, is asking for help, then I do charge. Um, <laughs> and I think of it as my time, you know, so I need time to read the play, I need time to make notes about it, to send, send them to you, and then to debrief those, those notes, and that's usually like the, the package mm -hmm. of a beginning process um, that is rare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, this just sparked a, a question for me, which is how often, uh, as a dramaturge, do you uh, pass on work because uh, you can't find anything in it that excites you or that you love? And how often do you say, proceed with the project uh, in hopes that you will find something because uh, you need money? Uh, <coughs> well, I'll speak to that because I feel pretty clear on it now, but that's only because I've, now I pass on everything that I can't do. Like, and what I mean is either can't do it from a perspective of schedule, or I just can't do it because I don't feel that my heart can, can find the, the, the space for it. Um, but I did, but that took me many years to figure that out. Um, and it's, it still makes me feel very terrible because I want so much to be able to do, uh, yeah, I want so much to so much to be able to be in that uh, position to, to push as much work forward as I can, but, yeah. Which is its own terrible thing, right? Because then it's just like I become a generalist and it's like I'll just do, you know, so it's important that, I'm, that I've come to this process and I think it's an important thing for dramaturgs to, to recognize is that um, there is somebody. If you're not, if your heart's not, it, there's somebody who's is, who's will, who will be, mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. you can be the the person who can make that connection mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah. Yeah. I might. Re uh, if anyone was at the panel yesterday, I'm probably gonna. You probably heard this already, but um, I, I run a new play development center that's been around for 60 years. So, and it was a membership organization, and so we've been working really, really diligently for the last 10 years to try to dismantle that. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Bob, uh, to, dismantle, <laughs> to dismantle that, um, and and we've we've we're successful. So th so so that's happening. It's become much more curatorial. So part of my job really is uh, to make sure that any work I embark on is work that I I can add to or collaborate with, uh, more collaborate with than add to. Um, that I am excited about collaborating with with the story and 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 with the artist. And if I'm not, that I'm I'm in sort of a, a 
quite a privileged position where I do have access to funding where I can engage with other dramaturgs and set up um, relationships between people. And so that's been, um, that's, that's been huge. Um, and, and recognizing that uh, doing, doing work as a dramaturg because that is your job as opposed to uh, being in love with the work is detrimental to the art form. Um, so, um, so that has stopped. Uh, for all of us, and um, and I think it's really important. Um, I think I think it's fundamental. I think as an institutional dramaturg, of course, part you know you have uh, a responsibility to the institution and to the agenda that's been set up by the artistic direction of the company. It's the Stratford Festival is a classical repertory company, where new work is just a, a little part of that uh, what we offer every year, and so therefore. My enthusiasms are sort of in two camps. There is material that, one, that I think has a chance of, 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 of appealing to the programming needs of the organization, and that 550,000 people who come there every summer as part of what our offering is, and also that I feel is going to somehow challenge the organization at the same time by bringing voices in that are going to provide different kinds of work uh, as opposed to the, uh, the classical repertoire that is available. So you're serving in a sense two masters there and sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't. Uh, obviously the most interesting ones for me are always based on the relationships. You know, I fall in love with every playwright that I work with and I always feel that my first duty is to make sure that their voice is heard in a way that serves what I think is their vision. And so in the, some cases, that can lead to work that no way the artistic director is actually going to actually think that this is a play that we should produce. But uh, along the way, I've been able to give them a few dollars and give them some time and all of those things. Uh, but that balancing act is very a, a major part of my job, actually, is trying to figure out how to, to serve both those needs. So I think as theater makers, like we're such collectors of really unique uh, skills and interests and hobbies and so one question I always like to ask uh, when I'm talking with other folks that work in theater is what else um, are you doing at the moment that excites you that's fueling your work that's something you're passionate about you're learning about you're participating in or volunteering with like just something um, that you're that you're busy with at the moment that that you're finding some joy in as well as the work you're doing <coughs> in theater <laughs> people, do, people do other things. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, I'm actively working. Joy is where I made a face because I'm actively working to expand my understandings of different communities and intersections. I'm part of a collective called Consent and Respect in Theater, and I'm developing workshops and facilitation for safer theater practices, not just um, intimacy direction, but like about actively um, methodology and consent in theater, but also um, the work is in uh, demystifying the processes of reporting. Mm -hmm. So flowcharts, like this is the experience <laughs> that's going to happen if you report to the police. This is the mm -hmm. experience that's mm -hmm. going to happen mm -hmm. if you call equity. Mm -hmm. This is the experience that is going to happen. Um, it's not joyful work. Uh, <laughs> Um, and a lot of advocacy work, a lot of work. I'm working with the Asian Heritage Foundation of Southern Alberta, which is uh, on this big thing about mainstreaming. Um, um, but the way that the cultural community and the arts community speak and work is so different. And so a process of reconciling and working with newcomers associations as well as cultural organizations to uh, bridge communication gaps. Wow. Wow. It's not always it's joyful. It's a little sleepy sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, why, that's why I live in Kingston, um, because it's, uh, not a, it's, not a, it's not a theatrical hub in the world. Um, and uh, it's a place that I can kind of repair to, um, and uh, where I can um, be reminded that uh, I'm uh, just a, you know, that I, that I just live in a place. 
um, which in big bigger cities uh, it's it's difficult to kind of remember that sometimes. And the other thing I do is right now I'm doing. I was telling Don this is so embarrassing, but um, the keto diet, mm -hmm. um, which I, I become obsessed with different things. So right now it's keto, um, and I read everything. Emma knows this because you know I've many different things. Um, but I do those things because they interest me um, in the ongoing life experiment of being alive. So yeah. That's my, yeah. <laughs> Keto is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a rock band, so uh, we're actually rehearsing uh, in the evenings because our drummer lives here in Toronto, so um, that's what I do. Uh, nice. I try to be there for my husband. I try to um, make sure that my day is filled with joy, that I've even in these difficult, difficult times where um, I sort of question everything I do and around what we do as theater makers and how we're doing it and how things are changing and how at this part in my life and in my career, how do I respond to all of that? Despite all of those challenges and, and often the uncomfortableness of the work and uh, the difficulties of it, I always try and res um, remember that our job is to bring joy into the world actually. And some of the, the way we do that is, is, is obviously creating empathy. And, and that ultimately what we do as theater makers makes a better world. That's it. I'll give what I want to be doing, and I'm not, and what I am <laughs> doing right now. Um, I feel like after the past few months, which have been really, really busy, I actually want to do something with my hands. Like we keep saying maker, and I'm like, no, no, I want to actually make something that I can hold and do. I'm not doing that yet. The thing I am doing right now is trying in vain to learn French. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I, my kids are a little bit older now. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, so I have a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I've pl I started doing this year is actually focus on other types of writing. I, I, I started writing um, I, and, and having it uh, published as well, so I started writing nonfiction. Uh, but I want to finish my, uh, my novel that I started a few years ago, and I'm also starting um, to write with a few people uh, a web series. Sarah, I, I just have one more thing because I wasn't very good. I, I walk every Sunday if I can. Um, I walk other days, but Sunday is when I'm usually home, and it's a place called Lemoyne Point. It's a conservation area, and uh, I walk it usually with a, a the same friend, but not always, and I do it because I love it. Uh, it reminds me to breathe and to watch how nature changes every week as I come back to it, and I find that really helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, you and I could talk about keto, because I've been trying it out yes. too. It means like MCT oils and the healthy fats. Yeah, totally. uh, but I just want to thank everyone for coming to Anyone this conversation. Anyone want to go for fried chicken? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what we'll do over lunch. Uh, Thanks so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your work with us.